I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Mogensen. She is a uh, pediatrician with uh, Children's Physicians. She practices at our Spring Valley office. She's a fabulous pediatrician, and she's also a mom herself who has a child in this age range, correct? Almost. She just Almost. turned a year old, so oh, yeah. we're getting there. So um, she's going to be enjoying all this with you yes. as well. So with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Mogensen. Thanks, Danny. Thanks all for coming out on this gloomy day and for watching from home. Um, we'll get started and then we'll have lots of time at the end for some questions. So what really are kind of the terrible or the trying twos? Usually everything's about it, you know, age two. They turn two and magically the light switches and they go from this happy, playful child to the one who's kind of terrorizing and getting into trouble. But really it can occur anywhere between age two and three. Sometimes it can occur earlier, sometimes even a little bit later. Um, so the, you know, the family who always says, oh yeah, I had a two year old, he had no, or she had no problems whatsoever. Well, it's probably coming or may just be a little bit later. Um, it signals kind of an end to the infancy, the stage where um, they're babies, they're on bottles, they're still getting their vaccines. It kind of um, marks a milestone, if, if you want to call it, um, in their life where they're no longer that, at that baby stage. And they go through just a lot of different kind of stages of development. Their rapid brain growth and development, and it's almost too much for their little body to handle. Their brain is rapidly growing, they're learning new things, and they can't always express some of those things that are going on, which leads to some frustrations. They want to be independent, um, yet they still need their boundaries. They're defiant, they can be aggressive sometimes, they're mischievous, they have mood changes, um, temper tantrums, this is all normal, and um, it's a good sign that your child is going through a normal stage of development for them to have kind of all of these stages. Toddlers learn through kind of various mechanisms. The biggest is trial and error. Um, they try something and they see what happens. And they don't have great memories like we do, so it takes them many, many times of trying the exact same thing to realize what is going to happen when they do something. So that's why it seems like you tell them, no, we don't do this, and they keep trying it because that's how they learn. They like the repetition, they need the repetition. Um, eventually they do realize that an action leads to a certain, certain consequence and they live in a fantasy world. They like to pretend to play. And then we'll kind of go through some of their developmental milestones in a little more detail. First is their motor development. Their gross and their fine motor skills really advance. So their gross motor skills, they're running, they're jumping, they're climbing, and the fine motor skills, the scribbling, the coloring, um, um, picking up their food better, learning to feed themselves with utensils. And their motions become much more refined. They can walk backwards, they multitask better, they're not quite as clumsy, although they're still pretty clumsy at this age too. They have better hand and finger control, and they're very, very busy at these ages too. Their attention span is, is short, but they do not have ADHD. It doesn't mean they're gonna have ADHD or attention troubles as they get older. Um, it's normal for them to have a short, or a short attention span and want to um, be kind of jumping from activity to activity. And you really don't wanna kind of express this, but you wanna allow kind of some structured play activities, but then also free play activities. You don't necessarily need to involve them in sports or kind of rigorous structured things all the time, um, but you really just kind of go with the flow, so to speak. Um, and those are just a little few more details of kind of the gross motor and the fine motor skills that are progressing at this age. Their cognitive or their brain developments. They're becoming more thoughtful. They can express their language better. Um, they can kind of give you an idea of what they want or what's hurting. Their speech and language may not be great yet at this age, but they can definitely express better what they want. They go through the problem solving, um, determining kind of cause and effect relationships. They do more complex play. They like the shape sorting toys, putting the shapes through the, through the holes, pretend play, taking care of a baby, um, playing, you know, with kitchen things. Um, and they have a basic understanding of time, although it's not great and they don't always necessarily mean that 
we'll do it later means, you know, tomorrow or the next day. They go from having two or three words together in a sentence to um, sometimes multiple words or sentences. Some carry on conversations at this age. Um, there's definitely a variation in language um, development between boys and girls. Boys tend to be a little on the slower side than girls, um, which there means there's nothing wrong with them. And each child is different as well. So it's kind of difficult to really compare at this age, you just kind of got to go with what your child's doing and um, how they've been progressing. They can definitely follow commands better at this stage too. So they can do three to two to three part commands, like go pick up your blocks and put them in the bin. Um, go get your shoes and your coat and bring them to me. They should know body parts at this age. They should know um, certain objects. When you mention, you know, ball or car, or shoes, and they should understand some kind of physical re relationships um, like the bear is under the blanket or on top of something. Most speech by kind of the two to eight, three, really probably three age range is intelligible to strangers, about 75%. Um, and definitely with toddlers language development they can't always express their emotions or how they're feeling with their words so that's often where you get a lot of the grunting and the whining and the pointing and kind of the tantrums just because so much is going on in their little mind and they can't always express the way that they want to they want to explore um, and kind of learn everything it is that's going on around them and they definitely test limits um, that's how they know what they can do and what they can't do. And they want independence, but on the same time, they still are dependent on caregivers to make sure that they're safe and to feed them and clothe them um, and kind of their basic needs. They definitely have wide mood swings. They can't control their emotional outbursts. They're very impulsive. Um, they want everything, but they don't understand why they can't. And they have trouble remembering the rules, which just leads to lots of repetition um, and them kind of trying the same thing over and over again. All normal though. They go from playing kind of more by themselves to doing better playing with uh, peers or in a group. But they still are definitely self-centered and very resistant to change at this age. Um, they often respond better to kind of redirection humor, distraction, um, rather than discipline and definitely reason. They just don't have the memory. They don't quite comprehend what a lot of that discipline and reasoning needs. And they, they do very well at this age by just kind of distracting away from whatever it is that's kind of setting off their, their mood or their tantrum, if possible. Your toddler does not have kind of well child checks with the pediatrician as often but they still go to the doctor fairly often so that involves um, you know following kind of the one year check the 15 month then the 18 month the two year and sometimes even a two and a half year visit with the pediatrician and those are still very important visits um, everyone thinks oh yep the you know when they're when they're infants they get their their shots make sure they're growing well well we do those same sorts of things at um, these kind of toddler visits as well but we also look more in depth at their growth and development. We use um, certain questionnaires that look at motor skills, problem solving. Um, we kind of do some autism screenings. We monitor for slow speech or slow development in other areas. So they're definitely still important visits to make sure that you have with your pediatrician. And some of the things that definitely would be concerning that you wanna bring up are the things listed. So if we have any concerns whatsoever about autism, um, they, your child does not make very good eye contact with yourself or others. Um, they're very off balanced. Toddlers still, they don't watch where they're going and they try to run um, and so they do trip and fall quite a bit, but this, you know, they should they should walk pretty good though. So if they're having balance issues while they're walking, um, other balance issues you think you want to bring that up. If they're not pretending or trying to intimidate or um, imitate what it is that you're doing, that's a concern that you should bring up. If they're not bringing things to you, wanting 
you to play with them, that's concerning. You know, they shouldn't just be sitting there by themselves for hours on end playing with cars or lining up cars or kind of some just, you know, withdrawn by themselves. They should be engaging you, siblings, friends. Um, they seem like they have no interaction whatsoever with what's going on around them. They um, aren't kind of trying to be nosy and get in and see, see what's going on or they're always withdrawn and sad. Those are all kind of red flags that you want to make sure you bring up to your doctor. Tantrums, very common at this age. They usually happen because your child is trying to do something that they want to do and they don't have enough tools to accomplish the task that they want to, that they want, you know, to do. Um, it could be that they're looking for attention and toddlers at this age don't necessarily care whether it's good attention or bad attention. They just want attention from someone um, and they figure some interaction is better than none. <laughs> they throw tantrums when they're tired, when they're hungry, if they're bored. And kind of ways to deal with tantrums is definitely kind of know your child's limits. Um, remember kind of the normal things that they're supposed to be doing and um, you know, one example I can think of, if you know it's about nap time and you have errands that have to be, you know, ran at that moment, know that there is a potential that a tantrum or a meltdown is going to happen just because toddlers are creatures of habit. And so when things kind of interrupt their eating or their nap time, they get really cranky and their way of cranky is, is kind of throwing tantrums. Um, so just kind of be aware of what's going on and kind of your child's schedule. You want to allow some structured control without kind of giving the bank away. So for dinner, instead of saying, what would you like for dinner? And then they say, ice cream. No, we can't have ice cream. Well, then that sets them up, you know, kind of to throw a tantrum because they were asked what they want. And now you say, no, you can't have that. So instead, maybe give a couple options. Do you want an apple or an orange? So at least they feel like they are making the decision, even though you're kind of controlling, because you'd be happy if they had either one. Um, and that can work good in a variety of situations. If you know there's a certain object in the house that the child always goes for, tries to play with, and you say, no, we don't play with that, and they keep going back to it again, again, if it's possible, just get it out of sight. They'll quickly forget about it, and it won't be so much of an issue. And if you can tell a tantrum is going to be starting and it's possible to redirect, they want to play something that they can't have that somebody else has, redirecting, redirecting them to a different toy or a different activity, something else that's going to get their mind off of what was about to make them really mad often works very well. Um, and definitely when you're away from home, bringing some toys, some snacks, things that uh, can entertain them. Making sure your child gets adequate sleep. At this age, really, they still should be getting 10, 11 or more hours of sleep at night. Plus, they usually need at least one nap a day. So making sure that they're really getting enough sleep and that they're not um, having outbursts or tantrums um, because they're overtired. Thankfully, I don't see this next thing very often, and that's breath holding spells, but it definitely can happen. Uh, some kids make themselves so mad or they get to crying so hard during a tantrum or a fit that they involuntarily hold their breath. They don't mean to, they don't do it on purpose. Um, and when we hold our breath too long, sometimes we can pass out. And so kids can do this. They will start breathing. It's not a seizure. It doesn't mean something is going on wrong, you know, in their head. They just um, get themselves so worked up that they ultimately, you know, have a pretty intense tantrum. The hard thing about this is you, as a parent, kind of want them to not do it because it's scary. But at the same time, if you give in to your child, it kind of teaches them that, hey, I can kind of get what I want um, because mom's going to get in because she doesn't want me to pass out because I throw a big fit. So the biggest thing you want to do is kind of try not to um, give in to their demands. Try not to coddle too much. This is usually a temporary thing. If they pass. Um, you just don't want to turn it in from a kind of involuntary thing to um, a voluntary behavior when they realize, hey, if I start throwing a really big fit, my mom's going to give me or my dad's going to give me whatever I want.
So some things that can help kind of with discipline. This is a huge topic and very broad, and I know we often have um, parenting you sessions too on um, discipline and things as well, which I recommend that you uh, check out for some, kind of some more really in-depth um, techniques. But one of the biggest things that I can't stress enough is try to stay calm. No matter how much they, they irritate and they push your buttons, um, if you need to step back and take a breath, that's what you need to do because if you start getting loud um, or talking too much, it kind of takes away from the reason that the child is getting in trouble and then they have a hard time figuring out why they're getting yelled at. You really want to be calm, direct, to the point so they know exactly what's going on, not, you know, a big conversation to get to the point that, no, we don't throw something. Um, because the child just kind of gets lost uh, in the message unless it's really kind of concise and clear. They really don't respond well to reasoning at this age, so I just kind of say try to avoid it. Um, avoid it if you can. Um, try not to yell or change the tone of your voice um, because sometimes that feeds into the child's tantrum as well. And you have to be really careful kind of with spanking, hitting, because it can teach aggression uh, as they get older. Extinction can be a helpful technique for kind of annoying behaviors, but not necessarily the dangerous types. The key to these is ignoring the behaviors. Um, kids do things for attention, and they'll whine and nag until they get attention sometimes. Um, and often, by ignoring some of those behaviors, will ultimately teach your child that they're not going to get attention from you. They're not going to get you to yell at them. They're not going to get you to um, coddle them. And the behaviors will stop. And then you, that works really well then if you give them attention or praise when they're doing things good. If they're helping pick up their toys, praising them, thank you for picking up your toys, help them with that. You're giving them attention, you're giving them um, love, you're interacting with them. And so kind of over time, they will then try to do those things to um, gain those positive behaviors, or positive reinforcement. Timeouts. Timeouts can be done when they really start to kind of understand that their action um, results in a certain kind of discipline or behavior. Um, it's a little tricky kind of until your child really can understand some of that stuff, but in general, um, it gives them a chance to get out of the situation that was making them mad. Um, they can kind of cool off a little bit. General rule is about a minute per age, so it's not very long at all. And you have to be really consistent and be careful not to overuse it um, because then they sometimes will think it's a game. So you use it kind of for more um, the severe behaviors such as hitting and um, biting, things like that. And you definitely want to act right away. So if they're throwing something they're not supposed to be, they're biting, you want to act right away. The more time you wait, the child forgets then what he or she was doing to get themselves in trouble. So you kind of want to do it right away. And definitely you want to be a united front. All caregivers ideally should kind of be on the same page um, when it comes to either discipline techniques or the things that they're going to discipline for. If you have one family member who allows them to, so if you have, say, grandma who allows them to hit her, and then you at home say, no, we do not hit, the child has a hard time remembering who lets them get away with that and who doesn't. And so they're likely to just think that everyone's going to let them get away with it. Um, and it's kind of harder to kind of control those behaviors. So definitely being consistent is very important at this age. Try to avoid saying no all the time, um, just because then down the road, um, it can definitely do kind of some self-esteem issues if they feel like all they hear is no. So sometimes instead of doing no throwing food, 
food belongs in her tummy, let's keep the food on the plate, not the floor, kind of things that direct away from always that no. Definitely though, no for the, they're about to fall off the chair they were climbing, you know, kind of more the serious, dangerous things. Um, if you save some, you know, the, really a lot of the no's for those situations, they're more likely to listen to you when you do say no, kind of in more like the serious situations. Be patient. It's gonna take numerous lessons, so to speak, for your child to know exactly what's expected of them and then potential consequences. Um, and then you have to be a good role model too. If you yourself do things that you yell at your child for doing, um, they're gonna see that and not know why you can do it, but they can't. So you really wanna be a really good role model. Um, and remember, children aren't little adults. These are all normal behaviors. Um, and things will get better. They will get past the stage. They will get to the point where they want to please you. Um, they just are going through this stage of development, which makes them do a lot of these things. Toddlers at this age are also notoriously picky at times with their food. But toddlers don't grow as rapid as, as infants do. So that's okay. It's expected. The best thing is to just keep trying a wide variety of foods. You never know what they're gonna like and one day they're gonna like something and the next day they're not. So even if one day they won't eat it, the next day they might. And sometimes it still takes these toddlers numerous offerings of the exact same food for them to eat it. So just offer a good variety of foods. Be a good role model. If you tell them to eat the broccoli that's on, your, on their plate, but you yourself kind of go, ooh, broccoli's gross. Well, they're not gonna eat it because they see you saying that it's gross. Um, you definitely wanna be careful too that they're not drinking too much. Um, a lot of toddlers love to drink their milk or their juice, but you have to be careful because those things fill them up and then they don't eat very well. So usually, 16 to 24 ounces of milk is great. And if they're over two, skim is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And actually that's what we recommend these days. Um, and you want, you want to make sure too that, you know, a good half hour, even hour before meal times, if you have a drinker at your house, nothing to drink before meals so that they get a chance to get hungry. And then you want to make sure that they start eating first before you give them too much to drink. And lots of water as well. Um, these days, no more than four to six ounces of 100% juice, just because of all the sugar in it, um, risk for teeth cavities, things like that. And don't let them walk around with something to drink in their hand all day, because then they continually will drink and they don't eat as well. Um, and sometimes it's nice too to kind of have the rule that all liquids stay in the kitchen. And if they're thirsty and they want to drink, they have to come to the kitchen, they get their drink out of their cup, um, or their sippy, and then they can go back to play. Most kids don't need vitamins unless they're really, really struggling with growth um, or eating, and that's something just to bring up at a doctor's visit. Um, otherwise, most kids do not need them unless recommended by uh, your pediatrician. You still have to be really careful with choking hazard foods at this age. They still like to kind of um, eat fast, so small food, you know, small bites, making sure everything is nice and soft, avoiding hard things that can easily um, be choking hazards, and try not to make it into a combat zone, you know, for mealtime. If they're throwing food on the floor, they're done. You know, then out of their chair, they can, you know, go play and do whatever, and if they come back wanting to eat, then they sit back at their, in their chair or at the table, and then you can put the plate of food that they didn't finish earlier in front of them, um, or a you know, very healthy um, kind of meal type food, um, fruit, veggies, whatever, um, and have them eat that way. But yelling at them to eat's not gonna work. Bribery's not gonna work. Oh, if you eat all your food, you'll get ice cream. That usually does not work at this age. And if you do try it, um, just don't give in. If they don't eat, do not give them the ice cream. Otherwise, you set it up that um, they know they'll be able to get dessert whether or not they ate. Oral hygiene is definitely a big thing at this age. They have most of their teeth by this stage. Um, and even though these teeth are not permanent, they still are very important and need to be maintained. 
Uh, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry rarely recommends the dentist visit about six months after their first tooth erupts. Some kids that might be a year old, some kids that might be closer to two. Um, and definitely high risk kids, um, if they drink kind of milk and juice all day, they're a little higher risk just because of the sugar exposure. Um, a lot of, uh, if siblings or family members have a lot of cavities and they may be higher risk there as well. Um, but definitely they should be getting to the dentist, brushing twice a day. Initially kids really only need to brush just with water or you can use a training toothpaste that doesn't have fluoride in it. Um, usually you do like the fluorinated toothpaste once they can spit out. Um, if they get too much fluoride in and that can cause troubles. Most family dentists, you have to be really careful, will say, nope, I don't want to see them until they're four because they don't want to have to deal with a child who maybe isn't going to sit still and easily cooperate with the dental visit. But that's not good because I see every week several kids in my office usually who have cavities or who have to be put to sleep um, to have cavities fixed or teeth pulled or caps put on. So you really want to, if your family dentists to do it, that's great. If not, then there are many great pediatric dentists in town that I would look into. It's okay to drink water with fluoride. So your child does not have to have bottled water. Um, those don't have fluoride in it. The tap water is fine and our tap water is pretty safe. City water is safe. It's okay to use like a Brita pitcher or something like that to um, to filter it that keeps the fluoride in, which is okay to use. And be a roll bottle, brush with them. Don't allow them just to do it by themselves because often <laughs> they don't get the teeth quite as good. So you may have to, um, if you have a child who does not want to give up that toothbrush, you may have to have them, let them have one, and then you have a separate toothbrush and still get in there and help them. And then just be really careful with sugary foods, um, gummy bears and things like that, stick to the teeth. Um, sour candies, anything sticky you have to be really careful with. Thumb sucking also can sometimes be an issue at this age um, and kind of a good age that really the weaning needs to needs to start. Usually it doesn't cause a severe issue with the teeth until age four or five but it's kind of a good habit to break um, early on because once you get to the four-year-old who's still sucking, your th sucking their thumb it's very hard to get them to stop. The best is just some gentle reminders. Thumb out of your mouth. Um, allow them, the only time they can suck on their thumb is in their bedroom. Um, sometimes that, um, that will get some, some kids to break that habit. They do make liquids out there that you can apply to the finger or the thumb that has an unpleasant taste that they won't want to suck on it. Sometimes you can even kind of wrap it up or use a splint, although a lot of toddlers are pretty, pretty sneaky and can get those off. For more severe things, definitely the dentist visit, um, and they'll be able to look at the mouth. And um, in very severe cases, they uh, can do an appliance in the mouth so that they can't physically suck on their thumb. And if all those things don't work, um, we have lots of great behavioral psychologists in town who can help with um, kind of redirecting some of these thumb sucking behaviors. Most kids aren't ready to use the toilet until age two or three. Um, some kids are ready, ready a little bit earlier than that. Some kids, it's, it's later than that. Each is totally different. You can kind of tell signs that they may be ready to start potty training. Um, you may find that their diaper is completely dry in the morning after they slept all night. Um, they go to the corner when they're pooping or they kind of go to their spot and you know that's exactly what they're doing. And um, in order for them to successfully potty train, though, they want, you know, your child wants to be clean. If they could care less whether they sit in a poopy diaper all day long, the child's probably not ready to be potty trained. Start early, though. Talk about it. There's lots of good books out there. Even when you're going to the bathroom, talk about, you know, we're going to the bathroom. Um, some kids like to be kind of the potty, you know, the flushers so they know exactly you know, what they're supposed to be doing and kind of feel like they have a part. Um, you can do potty chairs, you can do a regular toilet, it doesn't matter. If your child's not scared, have them on the normal one. Um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Scheduled potty visits can be um, kind of a good test to see where your child's at too. That means you have set times where they automatically sit on the toilet, whether or not they go, that's okay. That would be like first thing in the morning, before bath, after bath, before or after naps, before bed, kind of times where you know that they may need to go. 
once you start um, kind of potty training, try not to get upset if they have accidents. Accidents are normal. It's not their fault. They're still kind of trying to figure out what's going, what's going on. And that can just be an added stressor on your child um, and may kind of not lead to their success. If they're having too many accidents, then you know it's okay. Time to just back off for a little bit and try again. And definitely praise successes. Some need motivation. Um, motivation could be a sticker for every time that they go to the bathroom and the toilet. It could even just praise. It could be reading a favorite book. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, food, which you have to be really careful with. Usually stickers or even just um, kind of rewards of mommy or daddy time works just as well. Bedtime. Um, toddlers this age definitely like their routine. and Bedtime is one of them. They still need, you know, a good 10 to 12, 13 hours a day. Usually still need naps. Um, they may try to be a little more independent this age and kind of fight naps. I would still try to at least offer um, a their quiet time. They have to lay in their bed, their crib, whatever they're in. It's okay to play quietly, but they at least need to rest for a little bit. Crib versus bed. Usually it's time to start thinking about this when they're starting to climb out of the crib. Um, you don't necessarily need to go to a fancy toddler bed. You could easily just take out the crib mattress and put it on the floor or get a toddler mattress and put it on the floor if you're worried that they're crawling out. They could go in a twin side bed. Um, it's kind of whatever that you feel your child is going to tolerate. Um, and lots of bad habits can develop at this age too in terms of kind of the bedtime routine, wanting lots of drinks, getting out of bed, having to use the bathroom. Definitely be consistent you know, with their routine, they go to bed at the same time every night, they have the same routine, whether that's bath and books, brush your teeth, bed, whatever it is. Um, you always want to try to put them in bed, even at this age, while they're sleepy, not um, waiting until they're fast asleep in your arms before you put them in bed. Because then that way, if they are used to going to bed on their own when they're drowsy, if they wake up in the middle of the night, they're more likely to put themselves back to sleep and not require you to rock them to sleep. You can have a favorite kind of animal or comfort item, and item sometimes helps, definitely nightlight. And you may have to use a safety gate, um, a lock something if they're crawlers, you know, out of bed, out of their room. Um, you don't necessarily have to stay, you know, in their bed or on the mattress, but they need to stay in their bedroom. And you can allow them to have some control with their bedtime routine in terms of they can pick out their jammies, they can pick out their books that they want, the nightlight for the rooms, things like those are kind of some good things that they um, can feel like they're in control over. You wanna be really careful with TV um, at this age as well. There are lots of great programs out there um, where kind of toddlers can learn from, but there's also some that have no educational benefit whatsoever. So a little bit is fine, but you really want to be careful um, and not allow them just to kind of watch TV and play all day. Um, the TV, even in the background, can be distracting, can kind of take away from their um, imaginations and kind of the things that they, that they were doing, even if it's just play. It's okay to use daycares, preschool programs, um, they help kind of their social socialization. They, um, yeah. Okay. Um, it can help get them used to being around other kids, listening to other people besides you, learning to be more independent. Um, and then it can give you a break just to kind of have a breather um, during your day. And any child who has delays in terms of speech, language skills, um, motor skills, fine or gross, we often will refer to the early intervention networks through the school systems just to get um, some little uh, extra assistance uh, if they qualify. 
So remember with our toddlers, this is definitely a normal part of your child's development and we expect these things to happen. It will get over, they will grow out of it, um, and kind of the next stage is the stage where they want to be helpful and they want to please. So there definitely is a light at the end of the tunnel. You want to encourage their independence, their learning at this stage, um, but you still have to offer safe and consistent boundaries because that, even though they don't think that they want those, they ultimately need those. And it's kind of tricky, but the, really the goal of this whole time is to make your toddler think that he or she is in control, but really you're the one controlling your shots. You're just kind of helping them along the way. And they won't remember that you're the bad guy, that you're the one that takes away their toys or puts them in timeout or, you know, or gets them in trouble. Um, none of that will, will be remembered as they get older. I want to encourage healthy eating, consistent bedtime routines, um, and really it's the consistency, it's the routine is the best thing to help kind of get through this time. Um, and it really does go fairly quickly. So kind of enjoy while you can. Some good resources um, as well if you're looking for kind of more help on specific topics. Besides our Parenting You programs, which um, they often do kind of a wide variety of topics, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, is kind of the go-to resource uh, for all pediatricians. And then www.healthychildren.org is actually the American Academy of Pediatrics parent website. It's really great. They have tons of different topics about everything you can imagine. Lots of great articles and resources. Um, so that's a very good place to go. Um, and then I use Toddler 411 books as well. Okay, what questions do we have today? Do you want to ask your question? Yes. How many hours or, you know, what not of TV do you think would be okay for them to watch a day? Um, I think a day, you know, a half hour, probably two hour tops would be okay. Oh. Yes. The question is how much uh, TV time is okay during the day and really probably like a half hour, two hour tops. Um, and... Yeah, it's okay, you know, to be kind of, you know, one of either their learning programs or if there's something you're, you know, dying to watch on TV, as long as it's, you know, without too much violence and language and kind of all that stuff, it'll probably be fine. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what do you recommend for hitting? For hitting? The question was, what do you recommend for hitting? That's kind of a tricky one. Um, the biggest thing is being consistent. Um, so he or she has to kind of um, be disciplined, you know, every time it happens and by everybody who's watching him. So if it's an issue at daycare, daycare has to kind of do their thing um, at home, grandparents, you know, you name it. And a lot of times kids will hit if they're looking for attention. So if they're hitting because you said no, or because you won't give them the book or give them the toy, then if you're holding them and they're hitting you, the best thing to do is to put them down and kind of almost ignore them. You're kind of keeping an eye on them to make sure that they're not gonna you know, do anything that's really gonna be harmful to themselves or to you know, the things around, but just kind of ignoring so that they know they hit you, you know, and you're playing with them or doing something with them, they're gonna get put down and you're not going to do that. If it's over a toy or a book, it goes away. Um, and it's really just consistency. If the child's old enough and they understand time's out, they hit, they get a time out. You're in public and like at home you have a certain spot for a time out, but you're in public, like um, what do you do there? So the question is, what do you do um, if you're out in public? So if you have kind of the certain time out space at home, that's great, that's what you use. When you're out in public, Honestly, a lot of places can be timeout. If you're at the grocery store, the cart can be a timeout place. Um, it could be they, if you're at a department store, if you can, take them out to the car, and that's the place for a timeout. Or they sit right there on the floor, you know, if it's out of the way. A lot of times, two kids will act out more in public because they think they're going to get away with it or they're going to you're going to give them what they want 
um, like at the grocery store, you know, if you go down the candy aisle and all they want to do is grab and then they're screaming when you say no, either avoid that aisle or you get on it, you say no and you kind of ignore them and you let them make a scene if they have to. Um, and people understand if they don't, they don't have kids and that's okay. You just kind of have to do what's best to kind of, you know, get that across, but you can kind of make anywhere a timeout, and if it's too bad, then you leave. Any other questions you had with that, or? Okay, anything else? Yes. What do I do, like, when I tell my daughter, like, she can't have something, so she runs and then she throws it on the floor and gets mad? Like, well, throwing things. How am I supposed to deter her from throwing things? Because she throws things a lot. Yep, so the question is, um, if we tell our child no, and then they go either throw themselves on the floor or throw things. One, if it's things that are breakable, you probably want to have them up and put away out of sight before that's even, you know, an option. If they throw a little something and it's like, you know, a toy, nothing, you kind of want to ignore. You know, you've said no, they know that. That's just their way of kind of trying to get back at you, you know, even though it's not hopefully going to get anywhere. So kind of by ignoring some of that stuff, hopefully would get them to stop. If it's more severe, it's we don't throw, you're going to time out, or you're going to sit, um, you know, in your room, wherever the place may be. If they go and they throw themselves on the floor and they just, you know, do a major tantrum, you just ignore it. You don't try to pick them up. You don't try to reason with them. You don't try to talk to them. You just let them do their thing, and eventually they'll get over it. And when they're done, when they're over it, you know, then it's we get a hug and kind of, you know, move along, end of that one. Yeah. What about deterring your child from taking, <coughs> like, um, a cousin's glasses or something and then trying to hide them so that that person can't have their glasses anymore? So the question is, um, taking someone else's belonging, like um, the example is taking uh, a cousin's pair of glasses and trying to hide them. That's kind of a little trickier and a little sneakier. Um, for that, um, it's probably they take the glasses either a time out or they don't get to go play with that cousin as much. Um, or it could come from if the cousin's, you know, parent is there, coming from the cousin's parent. The, you know, no, we do not take those glasses. You go sit down. Or now you don't get to play in the activity, you know, or whatever it is that's kind of um, being done. That one's a little tougher, though, um, to really, you know, it's just really being consistent and some of those um, kind of more specific things, if you're having a lot of trouble, we have access to some, I mean, absolutely great um, <coughs> behavioral psychologists in town who deal with kind of a lot of this stuff. So some of these things, if you feel like you're dealing with these behaviors and you've kind of tried the general things that I've mentioned or you've read online, there are people out there to help. And just ask your pediatrician. We have some wonder, wonderful, you know, people who can spend um, a lot more time with you um, and kind of work on specific things to do to kind of control those behaviors or to kind of work around. Um, and uh, they have sometimes a lot of really good tricks up their sleeve that I don't always know some of those some of those details. So I would definitely, um, if you have any, you know concerns or kind of some other things that might be something to bring up to your pediatrician. Um, and there's, I mean, it's not, we have a lot of people who um, use our behavioral psychologist for a few times just to kind of get some other good helpful hints and pointers. And this is, that's what they train, that's what they do. Um, and it can be a really good, a really good resource. Yes. Do you uh, have a recommendation for uh, biting? Recommendations for biting, really kind of same sort of thing as hitting. They start biting, 
they get, you know, if you're holding them, they get put down um, to kind of not, you know, associate any um, kind of positive reinforcement with the biting. They get put in timeout. They get, if it's over a toy or something like that, you know, they get, your child gets kind of redirected to somewhere else. Um, but a lot of times it's still kind of attention seeking. And that can be kind of a tricky one as well. Still consistency, you know, if you have one person who um, does the timeout or um, kind of more the disciplinary person, then it's got to be kind of the same sort of consequence at daycare with grandparents too. Um, but usually that means taking away the toy or um, the thing that's kind of starting it all. Yes. Coloring on the walls, um, that can happen a lot. Um, if your child really likes to color, and despite you know numerous attempts that you know here's your paper, here's your colors, the only time honestly that they probably get to color is when you're right then and there at the table with them coloring, and then the crayons go away. Um, that's a tricky one. If you catch them doing it. That's one of those things, you know, that you could do timeouts for or um, you right then take away that stuff and, you know, put it away for a while. But really, um, it's kind of just pushing the limit, you know, see what they can get away with and what they can't. But sometimes you just kind of have to hide that stuff for a while or just supervise while they're using them. Yes. Um, you talked about in the education section about the benefit of early intervention. Um, how do I know if I should worry about my child's language development? She's 23 months old, mm -hmm. and she I know she understands everything I'm saying, but she's yeah. not using a lot of verbal replies. Yep. The question is, um, how do we know, especially the kind of language development, um, maybe if they're on track or not? I had mentioned earlier that we do questionnaires in the office. We do them at 18 months, 24 months, and then if we need to do a two and a half year checkup, we do them then as well. And one of the big things is language. So those questionnaires have specific questions kind of tailored to um, things that most children are doing at that age. And so it kind of breaks it down into categories. Yes, they're doing it all the time. Sometimes they do it or no, they never do it. And so based on the results, the answers to those questions, we have a score. And if the score drops below a certain kind of number, then that would be more at risk for kind of either some slow speech or, and it's the same way with problem solving and the motor skills. And so that's kind of one of the big things that we use. And then especially with language, we look at, we look at um, are they following simple commands? Are they interactive? Do they know their body parts, you know? And if they're the fourth child at home who everybody talks, for, you know, for them, well, then that's a kind of different scenario. So we kind of look into the, kind of the, some of the social history and things that are going on too. But I think I definitely rely on my questionnaires. And so based on those results, then I typically tend to talk to my families and find out how much you know, of an issue is really going on. Are they making no progress whatsoever for the months prior to that? Or the last couple of weeks, did they just really start doing more and kind of look at time frame, what's going on, um, and then determine if we need to refer them on. And um, a lot of times, if they're kind of on the borderline and the family has concerns, um, then we refer. And someone from the school district has to come out. They have to follow through with every single referral that we send them. They come out. They evaluate the child. And if everything happens to be on track for them, then they just then we monitor. Or if they qualify, then they get them into special services. So the best is just keep working with your child. And at the 24-month checkup, you get to fill out the questionnaire and kind of see. And you have to be careful, too, because um, some kids are – especially talkers, some talk a lot and some don't talk as much. And so it's kind of just determining what's right with your child. And usually that involves you and then the pediatrician kind of monitoring their development over the last two years. Yeah. 
Um, our toddler, she doesn't really like to accept a lot of help, and so she gets very discouraged, and that leads to a lot of temper tantrums. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for that? The question is, um, is a toddler who likes to be independent, not accept help, um, and then they become very discouraged. That's very common. The best thing to do kind of in those situations is to help but not kind of let them think that you're helping. So if they're um, trying to put on their shoe, kind of have it, you know, already a little bit done that they can kind of easily get it on or kind of whatever task. Um, if you know you're going to, you know, give them something to eat, maybe not have it completely broken apart, but enough that it's started for them. Um, and if they kind of throw a tantrum and don't want the help, that's okay. Let them throw their tantrum, kind of get it over their system, and then try again. Because at that point, they may be willing to accept. But it's kind of even without them watching or having somebody kind of distract even a little bit while you kind of sneak in there and help get started, whatever it is they're trying to do. But yeah, and it's normal. And then you just kind of have to, once they get to that point where they're frustrated, you kind of just have to let them throw their fit or redirect to something else maybe that they can, that that do. Sometimes redirection works really good at that age with those situations too. Anything else that I missed? Yes. My daughter sometimes will try to help with mm -hmm. uh, housework and she'll end up making a bigger mess than when it started. But when I finally am able to get the item away, like the broom away from her, uh -huh. she'll freak out and say that she wants to clean. How do I not make her see that cleaning is still a good thing, but this is how you're supposed to do it? So the question is, um, we have one of our toddlers who likes to help clean, but then they ultimately um, end up making kind of a bigger mess and then get frustrated when um, the broom is kind of taken away from them. The best is that you want, you know, to let them help. And so maybe it's, if they're trying to do an area that is really dirty or you're really trying to, maybe even trying to kind of redirect, ooh, I have something even better for you to do. Let's go over here. Um, and kind of trying to make it sound exciting and give them their own little area because you ultimately want to kind of encourage that helpful nature. And if it means in a certain area they make a little bit of a mess, Eventually, they will get bored with it and leave to go do something else, and then you can kind of clean up whatever it is. But you almost just kind of have to make it structured enough or find something for, her, for him or her to kind of clean up without totally kind of interfering with your, what you're trying to get done. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'll be here for a few minutes if you have any other questions. Thank you.